Um, and uh, good morning, everybody. I, I think what the first thing I want to say is I'm going to give away the uh, the uh, the key message first. This will save you money. So listen, because it's it's worth your while uh, following this through. So we're going to talk about thermal bridging and compliance with Part L. And I'm only going to talk about it in relation to new houses because it gets more complicated when you're dealing with apartments and gets more complicated when you're dealing with non-residential. Uh, uh, um, and the two things that we really want the building regulations to address is accounting for heat loss through thermal bridging and avoiding surface condensation, which leads to mold growth. So if you can keep those two targets of the building regulations in your mind as we go through all of this, it's about measuring the heat loss that is getting out through all these thermal bridges and avoiding uh, people being sued for uh, building buildings that have uh, mold. So just how, how we got to this point, what the, 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 what the regulations actually say. So part L, regulation L1 says that a building shall be designed and constructed to ensure that the energy performance of the building is such to limit the amount of energy required for, uh, for operation and the CO2 emissions. So this is leading straight into the climate change agenda, insofar as is reasonably practical. So we want this to be practical. And Regulation 8, which comes in under the European Union um, regulations, introduces the nearly zero energy performance requirements. And it says that we must limit the heat loss and, where appropriate, available heat grains through the fabric of the building. So it's L1 and L8 are, are, uh, and 8 are our guiding uh, regulations here. So on foot of those regulations, we've uh, built the technical guidance document to, to deliver on those and give you a prima facie way of delivering and meeting those targets. So really, from today, the first thing we've got to understand is what are we talking about when we're talking about thermal bridging? So what is a thermal bridge? Um, a wall has a U-value, uh, a planar element has a U-value, and that's measured in watts per meter squared Kelvin. And most people are now familiar with U-values. They weren't familiar with the U-values when I was in college, certainly. Um, and we measure the heat loss through those planar elements uh, in the U-value. And it's measured at a temperature difference of 20 degrees, 20 degrees on the inside of the building, zero degrees on the outside. And the wall, the terminology is that the wall is a flanking wall. Similarly for the floor, the floor is now a flanking floor and it has a, a U value measured in watts per meter squared Kelvin. But the yellow bit, <coughs> excuse me, the yellow bit is the unknown quantity that we're, we're calling a thermal bridge and we need to find a way of accounting for that so wherever we've got planar elements meeting we have in between it a, a linear thermal bridge that needs to be accounted for and it needs to be accounted for both in terms of heat but also in terms of surface temperature the heat loss is called the psi value and um, so that's, what, that's measured in watts per meter Kelvin, so it's a linear thermal bridge. And the mold growth issue is measured by the FRSI, but we'll go on to that later on. But it's determined by thermal modeling. So we can't get away from thermal modeling. The thermal modeling is being done somewhere in the system. It may have been done for you, or you may be undertaking it yourself, or you may be getting somebody else to do it for you. But thermal bridging is very much part of uh, analysis, is very much part of this. <coughs> Excuse me. So, really, <coughs> in um, TGDL, paragraph 1.3.3.1 1 sets out our stall, really, here. That we're trying to avoid excessive heat loss and local condensation problems, and reasonable care should be taken to ensure the continuity of insulation to limit the local thermal bridging at key junctions, that is around windows, doors, other wall openings, and at junctions between elements. And elements are things like walls, floors, uh, roofs. Any thermal bridge should not pose a risk of surface or interstitial condensation. I'll say that again. 
any thermal bridge, no risk of surface or interstitial condensation. And Appendix D2 of the technical guidance document provides the information necessary to assess surface condensation risk. Appendix D3 provides the information necessary to assess interstitial condensation, but we're not dealing with interstitial condensation today. So I'm going to park that for, for today. Paragraph 1.3.3.1 also goes on to say that heat loss associated with thermal bridging is taken into account in calculating the energy use and the CO2 emissions using the DEEP methodology. So I'll explain how thermal bridging is entered into DEEP. And Appendix D gives us further information in relation to thermal bridging and its effects on dwelling heat loss and how this is taken account of in the calculation. So, the following represents alternative approaches to making reasonable provision. And we're trying to be reasonable here, so um, bear with us. Uh, with regard to limiting thermal bridging. The first is to adopt the acceptable construction details for all key junctions. The second is to adopt acceptable construction details in combination with certified details for all key junctions. Third is to use certified details for all key junctions. And finally, the only other alternative is to use an alternative detail which limits the risk of mould growth and surface condensation to an acceptable level. <clears throat> and that acceptable level is set out in, appendix, in paragraph D2 of Appendix D, which we'll be going on to deal with later on. <clears throat> so, uh, paragraph 1.3.3.3, uh, the deep calculation of primary energy use and CO2 emissions takes account of the thermal bridging effect. In general, this is done by including an allowance for additional heat loss due to the thermal bridging, expressed as a multiplier, and we call that multiplier Y, uh, or Y factor, or Y value, the different terminology has grown up around that, applied to the total exposed surface area or by the calculation of what's known as the thermal of the transmission heat loss coefficient, HTB. Now, to just to recap, what does uh, paragraph 1.3.3.2 and 1.3.3.3 say? And I've drawn up this table. <clears throat> the first option is adopting acceptable construction details in which case you can avail of the 0 0.08 uh, uh, default U value, or sorry, uh, Y factor, uh, or you can calculate it using the values given in tables D1 to D6 in Appendix D. You've seen all those tables with all of the various different Psi values. Put them into your calculation, add them up, get a total, and I'll show you how to do that. The, then the second option is to use a combination of acceptable construction details with certified details, in which case you do the calculation again using values taken out of tables D1 to D6 and certified Psi values provided for you um, through the certification process. We'll deal with that later. Don't worry too much about it at the minute. Use certified details for all the junctions. You're not using ACDs at all. You're using certified details all the way through. And again, it's the same calculation. And then, finally, we have the alternative details, which limit the risk of mold growth in accordance with paragraph D2, in which case you use the default Y factor of 0.15. <clears throat> so we've got three kinds of details in that um, um, guidance. We've got acceptable details, we've got certified details, and we've got alternative details. And I'm going to go through each in turn and explain what we mean by each of those. So let's deal. <coughs> um, so, yeah, sorry, just to emphasize the point, Appendix D2 tells us what a, a standard the alternative details must meet. So, let's look at acceptable construction details. So, TGL um, uh, supplementary guidance has been issued called Limiting Thermal Bridging and Air Infiltration, and that's what it looks like. That's the 2021 version of it. There was a previous version of it, the 2011 version of it. Um, and it has two parts. 
The first part is the general theory of insulation continuity and air tightness. And the second part is the actual drawings, the acceptable construction details. Uh, it's combined into a single document now um, because we want to emphasize the linkages between the theory and the practice. And it's downloadable from our website at this link. Now we go on to the second category, which was certified details. So what's a certified details? These are details that are certified under the NSAI thermal modeler scheme or an equivalent INAB accredited scheme. And the purpose of the NSI scheme is to allow applicants to register as an approved thermal modeler of thermal bridging details and junctions for the purpose of complying with clause 1.3.3.23 of the technical guidance document, Part L. So uh, the thermal modeler scheme is on, available on the NSAI website <coughs> at this link. And it lists all the certified, all the thermal modelers who are on the scheme and who are qualified to carry out thermal bridging detail uh, analysis uh, for the industry. And here's an example of one. Um, not advertising anybody here, but uh, the things you need to look at when you get a certified detail is that it's got an NSAI stamp on it. <coughs> which tells you it's certified. It's got an NSAI reference to the person who did the, uh, did the uh, analysis, and you'll find that's the same person that's on the, the register. So that's how it's all tied up. Anybody on the register pays a fee, is audited, their details are, 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 are validated by NSAI. So you can be certain that's what the point of a certified detail is. You can be certain that the values given in the table at the bottom of the screen here for psi value or FRSI are reliable for the various different uh, U values of the, of the elements. Now let's look at the third category, which is the alternative details. So the alternative is any other detail, which is not a certified detail and not an ACD, which is compliant with Appendix D2 for mole growth and surface condensation. Now, the key factor in assessing the risk of mole growth or surface condensation in a thermal bridge is the temperature factor. And this is where we get into the sciencey bit. And that's called FRSI, which is uh, defined as follows. So it's the temperature of the surface of the internal element, uh, the internal surface of the element minus the outside external temperature, divided by the internal temperature of the room or the building, minus the outside external temperature. So that's the, the formula that tells us what the FRSI, what the surface condensation risk is going to be. For dwellings, the value of FRSI should be greater than or equal to 0 0.75, so as to avoid the risk of mole growth and surface condensation. Now, what that means in reality is no part of the wall, floor, or ceiling of a building or windows should measure less than 15 degrees. So if you've got a, a corner or a, a, a part of a building that's, more, that's less than 15 degrees, you're failing to deliver on the 0.75 FRSI. This is when we're in the risks area for mole growth. There is a, a little bit of an exemption, but it only relates to a 10 millimeter kind of corner in the bottom corner of a floor. Um, I wouldn't worry about that from, from the point of view of today. Get the main message across, which is the FRSI of 0 0.75 is what you've got to achieve in uh, residential construction. And how do we prove it? Thermal modeling. Here's an example of an ACD, thermally modeled, which proves that the ACD meets the FRSI. In this case, it's an FRSI of 0.95. So um, that's well comfortably above the threshold of uh, 0.75. So that relates to a temperature, I don't know, maybe 18, 19 degrees, well outside the danger zone for any part of the building. <clears throat> so 
Appendix D4 provides details on the calculation procedures for modeling these. So somebody has to sit down and model uh, the junction, and we all have to model in the same way. So these are the, the, the rules for modeling the junctions. The calculation procedure uh, to establish both the temperature factor, the FRSI, and the linear thermal transmittance, the psi value, is outlined in BRE IP106, which is quite old at this stage. The details should be assessed in accordance with the methods described in ISEN ISO 10 to 11 of 2017, which is the latest version of that. The calculations show two-dimensional and three-dimensional heat flow required uh, uh, to create these calculations, you need a numerical modeling software. And that's we're seeing the output of that on the bottom right-hand side of the screen there. Uh, to be acceptable, numerical modeling software uh, should model the validated examples in IS uh, 10 to 11 uh, with results that agree to the stated values of temperature and heat flow within the tolerance allowed in the standard for these uh, measurements. Several packages are available on the market. I won't mention any trade names here, but they are widely available. There are even free versions available to download uh, um, and, and play around with. And it's worth doing that. I think people really need to embrace this technology. It's not difficult to use, and it will run on your computer. Um, detailed guidance on decisions regarding specific input to the modeling uh, software and the determination of certain quantities uh, from the output of the software is contained in a BRE document called BR497, uh, which I outlines the, the conventions for calculating linear thermal transmittance and temperature factors. Now, Andy is going to talk about these later and how we go through the calculation in more detail. Just to recap, three kinds of details, acceptable, certified, or alternative. Um, now, Calculating the uh, transmission heat loss coefficient in deep. So this is really around how we go about getting a value to put into deep. Remember, we were talking about two things we want to be careful about, heat loss and surface temperature. So I'm going to look at a bespoke thermal bridging calculation in deep. And this is to account for the, therm the overall thermal bridging loss, the HTB, uh, using a building-specific Y-factor calculation. So there's an example included uh, in the, the, technical, the, the supplementary guidance document um, that we were, I referred to earlier on, and this is the example. And what it does is it lists all the ACDs that have been applied to a three-bedroom semi-detached house um, and shows you how to enter the calculation. And I'll go through this line by line with you so that you've got a good understanding of how this is done. In this example, and his, this is my takeaway slide really from today's presentation, we got a calculated uh, Y factor of 0 0.051 for this particular building, just using published ACDs and published psi values in the ACDs. And what that means is you can save about three grand on your average se three bedroom semi-detached by avoiding extra insulation or extra panels on the roof or whatever it is, you can decide. Now, if you're a builder, the ca this calculation takes an hour, half an hour. Would you pref prefer to spend a half an hour doing this calculation with all the published data that we've given you and save yourself three grand per house. If you're doing 100 houses, that's 300 grand in your back pocket for doing a half an hour worth of uh, calculation. But a standard calculator, nothing special. I think this is well worth looking at in terms of reducing the cost of delivering housing in Ireland, which is another part of our aim. So. Let's look at the, um, the thermal bridging calculating, uh, calculator. The, the SEI even produce a tool to help you to automate this process. And the DEEP methodology has this published tool, and it's available on the internet for free at that website address. And it 
it comes preloaded with all the ACDs in there. You just drop down and click on the ACD you're using and it spits out a Y factor for you at the end of that. You can even put in certified details manually. So you can do uh, the, the category one, which is ACDs only, or the category two, which was ACDs plus certified d details in this calculator. So <clears throat> I promised I would do a bespoke Y factor calculation. So here we go. That's uh, the spreadsheet open on the left, and on the right-hand side is the house we're looking at, which is three bedrooms, semi-detached house, three windows in the back wall, three windows in the front wall, a back door and a front door, and the blue wall is the uh, party wall, which is, doesn't lose heat, because it's the same temperature on both sides of that wall. The first thing we have to do is we have to identify where all the thermal bridges are. And that's, this is part of the, the compliance with DEEP is that you identify where all the thermal bridges are. Here they are in wireframe. We'll go through them in color step by step as we go. <clears throat> the first thing to do is to decide which are key junctions and which are not key junctions. And the decision on key junctions is a decision for the designer of the building. And it comes down to this. If there's heat loss through the uh, thermal bridge that would make a difference to the Y factor calculation at the end of the day, then it's, uh, it's, not, it, it's a key junction. If there's an ACD for it, it's a key junction. It has to be included. Short junctions, like the threshold there uh, in green, is non-key because we're going to account for the heat loss through the threshold by calling it part of the ground floor overall uh, uh, thermal bridge. And we're going to make sure as part of that, because we're now in alternative detail territory, that the FRSI complies. So we, we do need somebody to tell us that if we build it in accordance with this drawing, we comply with the FRSI. So that's, there are a number of uh, threshold details available on the market. Roadstone have one, Pardell have one, number of people around, uh, have produced these. If you build it in accordance with their uh, detail, you can claim their FRSI compliance. Therefore, you've got the FRSI. In terms of heat loss, you can either plug in the value that they've told you in their thermal, from their thermal bridge, or you can account for it in the floor uh, perimeter. So give it a name. Refer, and this can be your own name or your own detailed drawing, a reference to your own detailed drawing. Give it the ACD reference. This is key. This is, this is what unlocks all of the, the work that we've done in terms of, we've done hundreds of thermal models. <clears throat> the U-value target, we'll talk about this. It depends on what the U-value of the wall and the, uh, the flanking elements are. If they're within the range that's allowed for within the tables, you can then accept the, the psi value from the table for that particular junction. Then the only other piece of information you need to do this calculation is the length of the junction. So you measure the green line around the drawing. That's it. Simple. Multiply the length by the psi value, and you've now got the heat loss through that junction in watts per Kelvin. You do that for each of the other junctions, and I'm not going to do it step by step for each junction, you'll be happy to know. So mark them up on the drawing, put them into the calculator, assign their psi value, and do the multiplication. And on each step, you're getting, you're building up the picture of what the total heat uh, loss through the junctions is going to be. And just look at um, when you get to uh, the wall, sorry, the jam. Yeah, the one before that. Look at the length of the, uh, the jams. It's 23.4 meters long, that junction. And it's the longest junction in the house. So it's really important that you get a good size value on your window installed. It's no good sticking the window in the wall any old which way because you can't get your psi value. You'll get mold growth around those jams and they're the longest 
uh, junction in the building. So this is an area to concentrate on. How you put the window in the wall is really quite important. And the ACD show you how to do that. Follow them in detail and I'll show you a full blow up of a detail for the jam. That's why we're concentrating on this because it's the longest, usually, it's usually the longest junction in the building. Um, and there we go. All your junctions are in. You got a total heat transfer from all the thermal bridges added up, gives you uh, a watts per Kelvin figure. You then distribute that, you divide that by the total surface area of the building, which is the heat loss surface area. It doesn't include the blue wall because that's not a heat loss wall. It includes the ceiling, the walls, and the floor, and obviously the windows and doors. And that gives you the Y factor. So this is basic first, first year uh, secondary school maths. There's nothing to this. This is, anybody with a calculator can do this kind of, uh, this kind of calculation. And as I showed earlier, you've just saved yourself three grand on the construction of your house. So it's well worth pursuing this. I'm going to now look uh, in focus on the acceptable construction details uh, and how they contribute to helping to make these uh, savings. So I talked about this limiting thermal bridging and air infiltration supplementary guidance document. It comes in two sections. The first section is the general theory of insulation continuity and air tightness. And we've really worked hard on the text here to simplify it, um, to get rid of uh, spurious... Uh, the previous version of it was not so coherent. We've also improved the quality of the illustration. So we're showing photographs of key junctions that... And, for example, the intermediate floor was never addressed before. It's now included in the guidance. And updated uh, photographs which show the, how the industry has advanced to meet this challenge. There are now tapes available which weren't available in, in 2011, uh, certainly not in Ireland. And now they're widely available and, and, and easy to, to access. The second part is the ACD drawings, as I said before, and they cover six different construction types. Cavity, internal, external, timber frame, steel frame, and hollow block. And then there are general details that apply to party walls, internal partitions, and those kind of things, which are common to all of the uh, six above. And then the standard details we've been seeing, we're used to seeing these, they're laid out in exactly the same way. We've updated the text in some minor ways editorially uh, to, to accommodate the new U values. They're generally updated. The reason why we needed these, uh, so there's no change in the performance requirements. So you can use the 2011 ACDs, or you can use the 2021 ACDs, or you can use them in combination. We didn't change the rules, and we didn't change the psi values. Um, these take account of internal insulation in cavity wall construction, whereas previously we had only mentioned it in the text. So this gets us into the really good, really high performance U values down around the 0.12s, the 0.11s. These are now covered uh, by the ACDs. And it takes account of best practice now. There's been a huge revolution in the industry in terms of air tightness. We've gone from, you know, 28 air changes an hour in measured buildings back in the 80s up to now. Standard practice, we're getting below three. Uh, it's, it's, it's really easily achievable. People have taken on board that. People have stepped up to producing the tapes and the seals and all the rest of what we need. And that's been fantastic. I mean, we're, we're really leading the curve, really, on Europe in terms of air tightness. The drivers for the 2021 ACDs were obviously the changes in the TGDs, 2020, 2017, 8, 19, and 21. And they were really around things like better U values, better air tightness, and reduced thermal bridging. And my colleague Emmanuel has spoken about, you know, when you seal up the building, that's great, reduces energy, but you've got to compensate with ventilation. So there's a whole, there's been a whole step change in ventilation as well. 
It also reflects development and construction practice and the kind of products that are available now on the market in Ireland. And there's also the B car factor, the greater attention to compliance that SI9 of 20, uh, 2014 introduced to the industry. So the purpose of the AD, ACDs, they, uh, these diagrams illustrate good practice for the design and construction of interfaces in relation to thermal uh, performance and the air barrier continuity. So two things that we're focused on here. But there are other parts of the building regulations that have to be taken into account, notably part B, but also other parts as ventilation requirements and everything else like that. So the ACDs don't get you off the hook on all those other parts of the building regulations. They just focus on thermal bridging and air barrier continuity. So um, the use of the ACDs during construction will enable the builder to demonstrate that provision has been made to eliminate all reasonably avoidable thermal bridges in the insulation layer. So we're really trying to help the industry raise its standards here by these, the publication of these drawings. Where ACDs are adopted for all key junctions and are installed as per the ACD checklist, and somebody is checked off to say, yes, we comply with all of the requirements in relation to thermal performance, in relation to air barrier continuity, um, and, and the, the air barrier options that we're applying in this construction. The dwelling fabric design as a whole will meet the guidance in paragraph 1.3.3.2 of the building regulations, and will be accept it will be acceptable to use the Y factor of 0 0.08 in that construction. So that's the price. Build in accordance with the ACDs. Get the default Y factor of 0 0.08, or do a calculation and save yourself even more. So let me look at the changes in cavity wall construction that have uh, are, have been introduced in the 2021 edition, just to highlight the differences. Before you look at this, you need to read the ter terms and conditions. That's the first page in every set of ACDs. There's a whole description called the introduction, which is really the terms and conditions for the use. And I'm just going to highlight a couple of terms and conditions that people don't read. It's the fine print of this contract. Read it. Uh, it's only one page. OK, the te text is small. But these diagrams illustrate good practice, as I said before, for the design and construction of interfaces only in respect of thermal performance and air barrier continuity, and other parts of the building regulations need to be uh, respected. So that's just to emphasize that point. Technical guidance document B and the supplementary guidance uh, to TGDB that was issued earlier on, about a year ago, uh, provides guidance in relation to cavity barriers, cavity barriers within combustible insulation, and fire protection of structural elements. Now, we have included, wherever there's a, a possibility of combustible insulation being included in an ACD, we have included the fire barrier. If your insulation is not combustible, you may not have to put in the fire barrier. So that's a kind of a, uh, and that's all as a result of the Grenfell fire. This is a change from the, the result of the Grenfell fire. Where these details are used, as I said before, um, for the construction um, described in table D1 of the technical guidance documents, the psi values published um, may be used to calculate a bespoke Y factor uh, for the building. And this is the tables that they're referring to. So there are actually six of these tables for different types of construction. This particular type of construction is cavity wall. And it's table D1, the first one you meet. I think it's the most complicated of them. And we'll look at this in detail just to show you what the conditions that apply and how to use the table. Um, So the first column should have been highlighted there in my previous slide. The U value on the first column here um, is 0.18 watts per meter squared Kelvin. It's based on a 150 mil cavity 
which is either fully or partially filled. Depending on your, your insulation's thermal conductivity, you may need to fill the full cavity or only part of the cavity. But the point here is this is the backstop U value for the wall of 0.18. If you just look at what the impact of the lightweight block is on the same junction, so this is 101A and 101B, the heat loss measured by the psi value is halved by using these lightweight blocks. Now, the requirements around the use of lightweight blocks and protecting them from rain, uh, from moisture and all the rest of it, they're all part of the manufacturer's uh, guidance documents. So you read the conditionality in using those lock blocks, but you can see you're halving the heat loss out through that junction. So it's well worth pursuing that for very little extra cost, if any. Um, the second column there is for a more advanced U-value for the wall. So this is the 0.15 U-value, and it anticipates cavity insulation backed up by internal insulation. So you've got insulation in the cavity and insulation on the inside of the inner leaf. And you've got up to 150 mil cavity. You can have a lesser cavity. There's no requirement to have 150 mil cavity. You can have a lesser cavity, but you can't have a bigger cavity than 150 mil for these particular details. There's a target on the roof, and there's a target on the floor as well. And I'll come to that in a little bit more detail. But again, if you just look at the difference at the advanced, at the advanced U value, again, you're halving the heat loss by using these lightweight block, uh, blocks in that construction. Interestingly enough, though, as you go on to uh, a wider cavity, this is a 200, up to a 200 mil cavity fully filled or partially filled with insulation and delivering a 0.15 U-value. So advanced U-value, no internal insulation in this case. Look what's happened to the difference in the psi value for the floor junction. It's actually more than doubled because you're losing the benefit of the internal insulation. So a wide cavity is going to give you a worse Y factor, the internal insulation gives you a better Y factor. So there are, there's, it, there's more to be considered than just the U value of the wall, it's actually where the insulation is in terms of what it contributes to the Y factor ca calculation. So there are a couple of terms and conditions that apply to the use of these tables which are covered in the footnotes and, and I just want to explain those to you in a little bit more detail. Um, the first thing is footnote three says, where two building elements have one U value above its target while the other is below the target, the aggregate percentage change from the respective U values in the table should not exceed 20% for the psi value to be valid. So in other words, we're saying that the psi value is what's published in the table and we're giving you a bit of wriggle room we're saying, well, if your wall is not quite as good as, as we're, uh, we're suggesting in the target, you can make the wall less good. And you can compensate by making the roof or the floor better. But the difference between the, the width of your wriggle room is 20%. You can't exceed the 20% rule. Otherwise, you could put you know, a, a vast amount of insulations, for example, in the attic, and much less insulation in the wall, in which case, You've broken the rules, you can't use the psi value that we've published. By all means, go off and get uh, a thermal modeler to model the junction and give you a, a certified value, but you must stay within the boundary of the 20% rule to be able to use the ta tabulated value. This is just to make it easy, you know, say, you know, because it's not, not easy to build exactly a 0.15 wall. You might want to build a, one point, um, a 0.16 wall, and what are, is that allowable? The answer is yes, and you can compensate by having a better U-value on the roof or the floor. Uh, but the 20% is the wriggle room. There's another term here that needs to be kind of looked at. When you get into the backstop, obviously you're not going below the backstop. So your wriggle room is different in this case, and what we published here is how what the bandwidth is. Uh, what the wriggle room is on the roof, on the floor, and 
on a pitched roof. Um, so there, those are published values based on the modeling we've done. So this is where we got into hundreds and hundreds of thermal models, because we had to measure, we had to model every possible condition for different combinations of uh, U-values for the flanking elements. And we've done all of those calculations, and we've published these values. So as long as you stick within the range here, you're fine. In each case, the, the pitch roof is better than target, uh, and the, the floor is better than target, because the wall can't go below the, the, um, the backstop. So now let me just do a kind of a quick summary of the comparison between the uh, 2011 details and the 2021 details. And the reason they've changed is because the insulation has increased. The U values have increased generally, and we're trying to accommodate that. What does that do to the psi value, and how do you compensate for the effect? So I'll just highlight some, uh, some of the differences here. So obviously, internal insulation was previously mentioned in the text. It's now drawn in full on the drawings. And it assumes that we've got an air barrier on the cold side of the internal insulation. So a wet plaster type finish to, to act as your, wet, wet, your uh, air barrier on the inner leaf. And because of the position of that, we need to limit the amount of insulation on the inside of the wall to one third of the total insulation value of the wall. Two thirds in the cavity, one third on the inside of the wall to make sure we're clear of any possibility of interstitial condensation. I said I wasn't going to mention interstitial condensation. Sorry. Um, the other thing that's happened is the obviously the cavity has increased in width. So whereas previously we were looking at a cavity of around 100 mil, although never defined, uh, with around 60 mil of insulation in the cavity. We're now looking at 150 mil cavity drawn. You don't have to have that, but that's the, the maximum width that we can get on a wall ties in the standard layout of wall ties. Uh, and so a wider cavity to accommodate more insulation in the cavity. The roof insulation has increased, but only marginally, that we didn't make a big difference in, in, in U-values on roofs. They were already very advanced. And then the... Supplementary guidance to TGDB is accommodated here. You'll notice that the, the fire barrier at the top, uh, the, the cavity barrier at the top of the wall now goes all the way through the insulation on the basis that that insulation may be combustible and in the event of a fire, it may dribble out the bottom of the wall and not be there and leave a gaping hole which would allow fire to get from the wall into the roof space. We're avoiding that by bringing the cavity barrier to close the top of the wall cavity. You'll also notice that the insulation wrapped over the wall plate there is a little bit thicker. Um, it's as much as you can get in, uh, really, because it will all improve the construction. Let me just look now at timber frame and the changes in timber frame construction. So previously we were looking at an 89 mil type stud filled with insulation with plasterboard on the inside and a racking board on the outside and a 50 mil ventilated cavity outside of that with a, uh, a masonry outer leaf. That satisfied the 2011 um, requirements and it also satisfied the, uh, the uh, FRSI on the wall plate there. However, once we increased the values of the flanking elements, that wall plate is now too weak. It's too thermally weak to, to meet the, the requirements, and we've had to wrap the insulation over the wall plate. So that's a key additional feature in, um, in the 2021 details. So just look at the insulation on the inside of the wall now. So... We have moved the plasterboard layer right into the inside of the building. We put additional insulation on the inside of the stud. On the inside of that insulation, we've got a vapor control layer, which is going to prevent condensa interstitial condensation. We've got a services cavity because we need to get cables and pipes through, but we don't want those penetrating the air barrier layer. So we put in a cavity barrier. 
and this is becoming standard in the industry now in uh, both timber and steel frame, that there is provision made for our services in the wall panels delivered to site. The other thing you'll notice is that, uh, yes, that that's the discussion around the, uh, the wall plate and the, uh, the FRSI on the wall plate. And then we put in the cavity barrier at the top of the internal insulation. Again, the notion is fire inside the room, the insulation dribbles out because it's a combustible insulation. It may even go on fire itself, but it's not there. It's not going to stop fire getting into the roof space. So we need to block that pathway from the wall into the roof space so the fire doesn't propagate through the roof. In this case, we've shown uh, a timber block. 38 mil is sufficient to be a, a fire barrier crossing the full width of the internal cavity. If the insulation in the roof space is non-combustible, it will perform the role and you won't need the terminal blocking. But we don't specify in the ACD what the construction of the, what the type of insulation is. We only say where it needs to be. And it's up to the designer to choose the insulation. So worst case scenario, combustible insulation in the wall, combustible insulation in the roof, we need a barrier between the two. The other thing that to notice about the ACDs is this time around, you can zoom right in on them. We have been absolute, they don't pixelate, none of them pixelate. You can zoom right in and you can see how we've assumed you're going to build the junction. So this shows the sequence of assembly as well as the construction, the finished product we want. And you know, you can afford to zoom right in and see, oh yeah, that's a piece of tape that's stuck to the window frame and then stuck to the air barrier, for example. And um, it's just showing that level of construction detail. I think there's a, a greater confidence about the details because they were all done all at the same time this time around. And again, we talked about the jam detail and I'll just leave you this with this one. It's really critical that we get these right. We've, we've shown advanced details here where we're, use, we're closing the cavity at the jam with a, an insulated cavity closer. Whether that needs to be fire protected or not is really depending on the, dependent on the type of building. And generally, and generally, it doesn't need to be fire protected, but it needs to achieve a, a good U value and the thermal resistance is, is defined in the ACD. And again, you've got the, you can see the wet plaster layer on the inside of the wall. That's giving us our air barrier, and we have surrounded. So we've got reveal insulation uh, up to the window, and it's critical that that reveal insulation is in place to achieve the psi value that we require to meet the FRSI of 0 0.05, uh, sorry, of 0.75. So that's uh, my uh, presentation, and if you've got any queries, we're happy to answer those. Uh, at Building Standards. Uh, this is our email address. And thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>